It's been unexpected, right? For the yep. first eight months of the year, if you follow, uh, aside from the Magnificent Seven, right? That's majority of the total returns that we've seen year to date. Uh, you know, there's 493 other stocks that haven't participated. What's been welcoming of late is now we're seeing the market rally broaden right. with some significant mm -hmm. sort of breath, uh, which could set up really well for 2024. Yeah, you look at the Russell 2000, now up 15.5%. It wasn't that way the whole year. Um, we, we've heard from Nike uh, yesterday afternoon that about this warnings about the broader global consumer. Does this concern you that the consumer that has led this uh, economy for so long is suddenly feeling a little bit of a pinch? It's definitely could be the canary in the coal mine. Uh, because you have to pay attention to a global leader like Nike on the retail side. They're on the forefront, right? They, they have their pulse on the consumer. And we know that the U.S. economy is two-thirds is the U.S. consumer. So the question is, is this an indication that the Fed, right, has really dug into the consumer's pocketbook uh, in terms of, you know, just everything costing more? Uh, let's say if inflation now takes everything down, let's say your, your sneakers, if you will, come down, they're still putting that on a credit card. So that's 20, 21 percent interest rate, and that's catching up to the consumer. So that could be a concern going into next year. All right. So... What do we do about next year? I mean, Simone's been in the Magnificent Seven, seven stocks all year. She's riding it right to the bank. <laughs> Me, not so much. Do I chase Simone and, and try to get these Magnificent Seven stocks, or do I try to find stuff that maybe just didn't participate in 2023? Yeah, this is a perfect opportunity to sort of, you know, take some off the top uh, and rebalance, strategic rebalance. We do that for our clients all the time. We love selling into the strength of what's working. It's also dollar cost averaging into what's not working. Year to date, we're looking at stuff where we're allocating into sectors that haven't participated as much. Let's think about this like energy, even financials, but energy specifically. Uh, we like Occidental Petroleum nice. uh, and they haven't gone. They haven't participated. They're, they're even down about four or five percent year to date. Uh, but you look at the likes of who's actually, you know, who you're investing next to, Warren Buffett, right? He's yep. now accumulated about 28% uh, of shares uh, of the total outstanding shares of that company. The question is why? So he's been allocating dollar cost averaging all the way. And if you look at the participation of what energy is relative to S&P earnings, energy is going to catch up again. And they're going to start contributing, over contributing, sort of punching above their weight. Is there a fundamental energy story looking forward? Because, you know, shale... Uh, production has gone uh, crazy this year, despite OPEC, you know, cutting uh, their production. What's the? Is there a fundamental energy story of a re reason you should be invested? Uh, in specific names. Well, going back to OPEC, I mean, one of the reasons why Warren Buffett's doing it is also national security, right? It's the United States play. I mean, they just took over another one of their largest competitors on Oxy, and they're consolidating. Now they have about 13 billion, 13 billion barrels a day. But on a global scale, to your point, yeah, you look at the, the uh, geopolitical tensions in the you know, Red Sea right now, uh, that's 12% you know, of the shipping uh, of just not only consu consumption, but also oil. Uh, so that's that could be, uh, you know, a sort of a catalyst for oil into the next year. Uh, but also look at what oil has been able to do with OPEC um, cost controls, price cuts. Um, they're going to get a handle on, on putting a bottom under oil, we believe. Google is also one of the names uh, you uh, call out here. It's a name I know pretty well. It's at a 52 week high today, a little bit shy of its all time high, uh, but it's had a nice uh, bounce uh, over the last uh, 12 months. What's your thoughts there on, on, on Google from here? Yeah, Google, again, out of the Magnificent Seven, they are sort of, I would say, late to the game, but they still have room to run, right? Okay. And so with Google, there's so much going on. A couple of, you know, about the last couple of years, they've been doing a lot of internal restructuring. Now their top line and bottom line revenue are both trending in the right direction. So revenue growth and operating efficiencies of 57%. Coupled with next year, you're going to add in, you know, let's say a political year, more uh, sort of activity on the ad spend, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. about 10 to 12 billion in the U.S. alone. And Google will get a fair share of that. Obviously, there's some antitrust issues here and there. Um, but at the end of the day, even if they're broken up, right, the baby bells in the early 80s, think about that, that unlocked tremendous shareholder value moving forward. And if they're not, you know, you still have a great diversified business right there, even with Google. And obviously the AI play is in the early innings. 
The other big play this year, and I know this is one of your recommendations, has been GLP-1s, these diabetes-turned-weight-loss yeah. drugs that seem to be game-changing. You, you, you like Eli Lilly. Uh, we've seen an absolutely phenomenal run in their shares so far this year. They're up uh, 56% today, to date. Um, why do you like it from here? Yeah, Eli Lilly, uh, their competitor, Nova Nordis, you know, if you own both of them, you're owning the total addressable market. Right now, think about that. If you combine both of them, it's about $15 billion today. It could go up to $150 billion in, by 2030. And so both of those stocks have tremendous sort of runways ahead with regards to what the market is out there. And it's not just for vanity anymore, right? Obviously, you've seen the headlines with Oprah or maybe the Kardashians are sort of on this train, <laughs> right? Uh, no one really knows, but I think Oprah has basically disclosed that earlier this week or last week specifically. That being said, there's also a lot of health benefits. And then that's what makes this story even more interesting because then you're going to bring in the healthcare providers such as insurance to support that. And if that happens, it's tremendous. There's heart health as well as uh, Alzheimer's. Well, you know, are there any other names other than Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk that you are you know, tiptoeing around? I, there was a report about Amgen and its potential drugs. Every Pfizer's tried to get in on there. Any, any, anywhere else, any other names in the healthcare space? You know, at, at the end of the day, if you look at what we discussed before, what's not participating in the market, right? Large cap value. So that's healthcare, again, right? Energy, healthcare, financials. Those look um, sort of attractive from a valuation standpoint. If, you, if we believe that the market would broaden out, which we do for 2024, you want to rebalance and add some, again, healthcare to your portfolio, uh, such as, let's say, Pfizer, as an example. Um, and also, they pay a good dividend, right? So you get paid while you wait. What do your clients, do your clients ask you about crypto? And if so, what do you tell them? Like the ex you know, terms of exposure. First, uh, you know, personal disclosure, never invested in crypto. Yep. Um, don't own it. Yep. Um, and my clients are older, retired. Right. You know, so they, so they, they, they they're retired, they like being retired, and they want to stay, stay retired. retired. <laughs> and so not to say that crypto is not that asset class that's interesting, you know, with our kids and everything else in the future as sort of an alternative to take a look at. But just for us right now, we're just not in that space. Well, for retired folks looking for income, I mean, you can actually go fixed income these days. So how do you kind of talk yeah. to your clients about so, that? Fixed income is sexy again. Yep. That's, I constantly use that line um, simply because we haven't seen sort of four to five percent. Um, obviously, we saw Treasuries over five yep. uh, for quite some time. We did lock in a lot of U.S. Treasuries, mm. um, and I know that it's not so. You know, on Wall Street, they basically say, "Oh, well, that's just boring." But boring's good, especially when you're trying to sort of just compound wealth, and it's not a bad place to be. We also use that cash, right? It's a cash liquid alternative to strategic rebalance. So we believe there's going to be more volatility ahead in 2024. There hasn't been that in, in this past you know, trading year. So when that happens, we strategic rebalance. Uh, we take advantage of some opportunities, dislocations in the market. And uh, so long term, it really helps out for our client total return.